Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club. Welcome to our Friday Forum and the second program in our series on keeping Oregon's promise. Today we're focusing on leadership and our speakers are Chris Coleman, Gunn Denhart, and David Yaden. And then Ethan Seltzer will be our moderator for the entire series. Before we begin the program, I have our usual uh, items of City Club business. Next Friday, October 10, please join us for Oregon Values and Beliefs, what Oregonians care about, believe in, and want for the future of the state. Joining us will be Joanne Waller, Executive Director of the Oregon Education Association, and Duncan Wise, President of the Oregon Business Council. This should be really a very fascinating presentation of survey results which span over a decade, which uh, look at Oregonians' beliefs about uh, issues in politics, public funding, education, et cetera. This program will begin early at noon with doors opening at 12.30, excuse me, 11.30, because we'll also be voting that day on the club's study of ballot measures 2651 and 2652. Those are the ballot measures that propose to create a public utilities district in Portland. Look for your bulletin in the mail or at, uh, I think there are some copies here, uh, to learn what the study committee recommended. And of course, make your, reserve your place at the lunch early or either online or by phone. The City Club annual fund campaign is well underway. The goal for the 2003-2004 annual fund drive is $115,000. Your contributions help sponsor events such as the Keeping Oregon's Promise series that we're hearing from today, as well as citizen research such as our ongoing studies of the Portland Development Commission and school finance. Contributions can be made by credit card or paid as an automatic uh, monthly withdrawal, and there are also contribution envelopes here at the back table. Next Tuesday, October 7th, City Club brings back an old tradition, the new member reception. Join us in the City Club office from 4 to 6 p.m. for a chance to meet other City Club members and staff. Uh, members from research, programming, and issue committees will be there, and they'll introduce, tr introduce those elements of the programs of the club to, to new members. There'll be great food donated by Voila Catering, and this is a great opportunity to meet uh, other club members, new and old, and just have a good time. Uh, it's, uh, the purpose of the reception is for new members, but of course everyone's welcome. Just please make a reservation by contacting the office place. If you're not a City Club member, today is the perfect day to join. During this series, as part of the Keeping's Oregon, or Keeping Oregon's Promise series, the $25 new member fee is being waived. Uh, payments can be made uh, monthly and withdrawn directly from your checking account if you like. See one of our staff people today after the program to sign up. Let's see, we have a few new members I'd like to acknowledge. Let's see, I'll ask them to stand up and then we'll applaud uh, when we when both of them are, are up here. Let's see, Gerald Marsick. Is Gerald Marsick present? Great, welcome. And then uh, Cynthia Kirk. Cynthia Kirk here? Where did she? There she is. Welcome, both of you. I'd also like to welcome Greg Payne, who is chair of the Albuquerque, New Mexico City Council. And I gather that uh, that's it. Welcome. There he is in the back. I gather that uh, you're considering forming something like a city club in Albuquerque as well. Good luck. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made uh, possible in part by funding from Washington Mutual and Portland General Electric. We're very grateful for their support. Now on to our program. Many of us are, are aware of, a, of an almost mythical time in Oregon's not so distant past when Oregon was known nationally for producing innovative leaders and ideas. Tom McCall, Neil Goldschmidt, and many others captured the imagination and trust of Oregonians and pioneered the Oregon innovations that for several decades defined America in the eyes of much of the rest of, or defined Oregon in much of the, the eyes of much of the rest of America. So what has changed? Why do polls and pundits now suggest that trust in government and business leaders is at an all-time low, even in Oregon, with a reputation for generally squeaky clean ethics in business and government? Today we've invited three of Oregon's most interesting leaders to participate in really what's a conversation about leadership. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna describe, uh, list our people in the order that they're sitting here, but I'm not quite sure what order we're gonna do the presentation, so just bear with me here. 
Since he became Portland Center Stage's artistic director in May 2000, Chris Coleman has led PCS to become one of the most exciting performing arts groups in the city's history. And Chris has emerged as one of the, our most important arts leaders. Before he came to Portland, he spent 12 years as artistic director of Atlanta's Actors Express, a company he co-founded. He has directed plays and operas at major theaters across the country, and he is on national and international boards and advisory committees related to the performing arts. He holds a BFA from Baylor University and an MFA from Carnegie Mellon. I was interested to note that Gunn Denhart's resume tells one first and foremost that she is chairperson of the board of the Hannah Anderson Children's Foundation, whose mission is to improve the health and education of vulnerable children. Only later in her resume does one read that, she, that in 1983, she co-founded Hannah Anderson Corporation, the children's clothing company. It was through her leadership that her company committed itself to community involvement and family-friendly work practices, eventually leading to the foundation or the formation of the foundation in 2001. Gunn Denhard is on the board of Businesses for Social Responsibility, of which her company was a founding member, and she is vice chair of the Oregon Business Alliance. She received her MBA from Lund University in Sweden. David Yaden has been involved in public affairs in Oregon for 30 years, beginning with his work in public opinion analysis in the early 1970s. Among his first clients were Portland Public Schools, which then was unable to secure a permanent tax base, and Neil Goldschmidt, who was then running for mayor. Dave Yaden later became chief of staff for a congressman, special assistant to US Transportation Secretary Neil Goldschmidt, director of corporate planning for a Fortune 500 company, and director of Oregon's uh, Department of Energy. He's now retired. Over the work his years, over the years, his work has included analysis of trends in Portland that led to Mayor Goldschmidt's core programs to retain families in Portland, uh, key authorship of Governor Goldschmidt's, uh, Goldschmidt's Oregon Comeback Economic Recovery Plan, crafting the 1987 school safety net measure, which was passed by voters, and more recently, development of a proposal for an extensive citizen deliberation project as a prelude to tax reform. Ethan Seltzer will be the moderator throughout this series. He currently serves as the director of the School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. He was appointed in 1992 as the first director of the Institute of Portland Metropolitan Studies in the College of Urban and Public Affairs at PSU and served in that capacity through August of this year. Prior to joining the Institute, Ethan Seltzer was the land use supervisor for Metro. Other work experiences included serving as an assistant to Portland City Commissioner Mike Lindbergh, assistant coordinator for the Southeast Uplift Neighborhood Program, and drinking water project coordinator for the Oregon Environmental Council. He currently volunteers as the president of the City of Portland uh, Planning Commission and as treasurer of the board of the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. He is married, he's a dad to two great kids, and he tells us he is responsible for walking an old dog and a weird cat and is taking accordion lessons. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna handle questions a little bit differently than usual uh, during this series. Our board host, Nikki Lynch, will ask the first question, and we'll take only written questions from other club members. Nikki is a senior financial consultant and vice president at Merrill Lynch, a city club member for over 16 years. She has served as a chair of the research board, and she currently chairs the program committee. Following Nikki's question, we will open the program to questions from city club members, but because we're structuring this, uh, this series as sort of a moderated dialogue, we'll only take written questions from city club members. That will allow Ethan to guide the flow of conversation a little bit better. There should be question cards and pens on, on all your tables. Please write your question on a card and then pass that to one of our staff members and uh, they'll bring them up to the front. Uh, be sure to identify yourself by name and that you're a city club member. Thank you and let's go on to our program. Thank you for that introduction. I, actually, a lot of the things I was going to say you already told. So, uh, I moved to Oregon with my family in 1983, and that was the year two that my husband and I started Han Anderson. Um, to show our customers that our clothes were really good, we came up with the idea to um, have customers return the used clothing, and we would give them a discount towards the new purchase, and we call that Hannah Downs. Um, we didn't want to sell the, the clothing, so we decided to donate them. And as I found 
were looking for places to donate, I, I came into contact with different charities in, in Portland. And for this little girl from Sweden, I could not believe what I saw, that there are children in America who didn't have clothes. You know, and that there were children in America, I le later learned that 25% uh, of kids today live below poverty level. And, um, you know, for someone running a business, we, you know, I thought we can't do a whole lot, but we'll do what we can do to help this. And of course, we've given over the years away a lot of clothing. Um, and then we also decided to, that we would donate 5% of our pre-tax profits to children in need. And as you heard earlier, that has led, um, as my role at Hannah changed from being the owner to being the founder about two years ago, uh, we, may, we formalized that um, uh, giving and started the Hannah Anderson Children's Foundation with the purpose of helping children in need in the communities where we operate. Um, so, how we do, um, you know, just like uh, my eyes were open when I saw that there were such a need in the community, I wanted Hannah Anderson employees to experience the same. So we have a very unusual model. We, everybody at Hannah who wants can be involved in deciding where the money goes, but they have to go and visit the the different um, nonprofits and to learn and come back and present to the group what they see. And I think this is a way to build future leaders. Um, one thing of, that really impresses me about America and that I don't see at all in Sweden, that people really do get involved. And um, I've um, cherished that and I've tried to, to do the same as I, I live in, a, in this community. Um, about four years ago, I was involved in starting a, a group called Oregon Business Association, not Oregon Business Alliance, that's someone else. <laughs> so we started Oregon Business Association as a moderate bipartisan voice for business in Salem, um, thinking that we, you know, we need to uh, take care of our, of our environment and we need good schools in the community. So that's our main purpose for being. And I think we've been pretty successful at the past legislator, actually. Uh, we are, uh, our executive director is Lynn Lonquist, who's an, um, previously in the legislator, and he's been my mentor in terms of learning how the governmental section, sector works. Um, I think it's pretty interesting that we have on the panel uh, people from different walks of life, and I always believe in diversity, you get a much more interesting conversation. And um, so we have, you know, one, I'm representing business, and then we have a governmental person and a person from the nonprofit sector. And what struck me uh, is that the sort of the way things operate in these different sectors are very, very different. As I came from business and I looked into the nonprofit sector, I quite couldn't kind of understand why things were the way they were. Well, <coughs> now I know. Um, and the same thing with the governmental uh, sector. It was, to me, it's almost like learning a new language, you know, to see how, how different things operate. But um, to make this a great state, we need all of these uh, entities, and we need all to work together to continue to have Oregon be a wonderful place. I probably did more than my five minutes. No, you were perfect. <laughs> uh, I'm enjoying my tea, so I'm going to stay right here. Um, uh, when, when we were given the topic of discussion today, I, I thought about, uh, about a million things because as a relative newcomer to the community over the last four years, one of the really um, uh, things that my brain has been focused on is how do you um, – how do you lead an organization within this community towards success? Um, and in, in, in I think um, it is a community that is unique from other places that I've lived and worked. And one uh, sentence from a book that I read kind of came up, because it, it, it's been sort of a, a, a guidepost for me. A friend of mine gave me about a year and a half ago a book called The Tao of Power. It's aphorisms by Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism 2,500 years ago, about leadership excellence and leadership. And the sentence that stuck with me was that everything in the universe is moving inevitably toward its opposite. 
everything in the universe is moving inevitably toward its opposite. Day to night, birth to death, fall to summer. And the suggestion is that if you are a leader, your task is to sense where those cycles uh, are going to land, how they're going to affect your organization, your community, your life, the people that you're working with, your financial trends. And, and I, you know, I look back to the, our, uh, what we experienced as a, a country, you know, at the end of the economic boom of the last decade and think if we had just, you know, heard that sentence and thought about it for a moment, maybe we would be in a slightly different situation. But when I hear Andy's initial comments and a lot of the discussion in the community about where are the Neil Goldschmidt's, where are, you know, the Tom McCall's, um, uh, it, it makes me think about something else that, okay, if everything is moving inevitably toward its opposite, then what is the cycle that we're in right now and why are we going to be in 20 years from now? And, and is the leadership, the type of leadership that was successful 20 years ago, even what we should be looking for? And when I look around at this community, um, I actually see incredible leaders, um, really kind of brilliant leaders, um, especially in the business and the nonprofit sector. I, I think about um, Bob Girding and what they're doing down in the brewery blocks. I think of Christy Edmond at Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, which is, you know, her, what she's dreamed up and made possible in this community is amazing. I think of Dan Wyden at Wyden and Kennedy. I think of Homer Williams in the Pearl District. I think of Charlie Hales and what the people at City Hall did with the transportation in this city, which is unprecedented in any, any place in this country. Um, and I look at, um, and I'm supposed to be talking about my own history, but I'm more interested in this. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I look at those people and I ask myself, okay, now why have they been successful? What have, what have been the, um, the kind of uh, threads uh, of the, their personalities, their ideas, and the way that they've gathered support for it? And the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, I, you know, you think of this city, we would like to characterize ourselves as sensible. It's a very sensible town. We're very practical folk. You know, ambition is seen as a slightly, you know, tawdry thing that we, we should stay away from. Um, but I, you know, I look at the ideas that each of the people that I just referred to um, have brought to fruition, and none of those are sensible ideas. They are big, audacious, really kind of crazy but really exciting ideas. And I think that that's kind of a critical distinction that I'm um, discerning or, oh, oh, the other person I would add to that list is John Buchanan of the Art Museum. I think that story is astonishing. Um, I, I think that Portland is a really pleasant place to live. You know, even so, even if the economy stinks, even if we say we're the hungriest state in the country and our school system stinks, you know, we still can go ski at Mount Hood. You know, we can go hike in Forest Park. You know, it, it's just a really pleasant place to live. And I think that to get ourselves truly engaged, not just talking, but truly engaged into action, there has to be an idea set before us that is exciting enough to engage in. And so I, I would observe that each of those people that I uh, referred to earlier came up with a really crazy, exciting idea that, that spoke to the kind of um, oddball, eccentric, um, uh, whimsy within the conservative spirit that is Portland. Um, I, I think the other thing that they've done is e each of those people are, um, they have such fortitude, such determination in terms of moving toward their goal. And the other, am I going on too long? Shut me up if I'm going on too long. Uh, the, the other observation I would make is um, that this city, it, there is more um, dissent, vocal dissent in this city than any community I've ever lived in. It's the most kind of vocally engaged in the community process of anywhere I've ever lived, which I think is fantastic. But if you're a leader and you're facing that, you can sometimes think that means if I'm hearing that much dissent, that means I need to quit or my idea is bad or I should do something else. And, and each of the people that I mentioned, um, I, I, you know, they listened to the dissent, they changed their game plan, and then they moved forward and figured out, how, okay, if that game plan is not going to fly with the community, what game plan might fly? Um, the best advice that I've gotten, and then I'll kind of shut up and you know, if you want to know more about my personal history, I'll, I'll tell you later. Um, the best advice I got was from John Buchanan about a year after I arrived. I said, okay, you have, your story is astonishing. 
um, how have you accomplished it? What If you were coming in in my position and you're going to try to turn this organization around, you've been asked to come into the community and, and, and turn an organization around, how would you go about that? What would you advise to me? He thought about it for a long time and he said, do what you think is right, keep your head down, don't listen too much to the noise. <clears throat> and I thought that was the smartest thing I've heard about trying to lead in Oregon so far. I've always wanted to stand at this podium, and I'm not going to pass the chance. So. <laughs> you've, you've, you've heard from two gifted and truly delightful leaders. I'm not a leader. I'm a follower, and I speak to leadership from that honorable perspective. If Tom McCall hears our bereaved pining for his lost leadership, and if he's tuned into the City Club, surely he hears it, he's done well not to respond. <laughs> Still, we do yearn for his vision, his forceful direction, his courage. If schools close early and the legislature barely closes at all, if we seem adrift, divided, impotent, surely Tom would know what to do. He would tell us in those stentorian tones what we must do. He would rally us and raise us up to believe we can do it. He would, by heavens, lead. How reassuring this nostalgia we allow ourselves. But it is nostalgia. For the reality is that on the subject that seems to be devilous today, overhauling our shambles of a decrepit public finance system, Tom McCall was no Tom McCall. <laughs> oh, he tried. He tried as perhaps the most popular leader in the state's history. In the words of Brent Walth, his gifted biographer, McCall virtually controlled the Oregon press and in turn the imagination of Oregonians. In 1973, McCall crafted a plan to cut and cap property taxes, to stabilize and equalize school funding, and to shift the tax burden to the richest. Under his plan, four out of five Oregon taxpayers would have gotten relief. He stumped tirelessly for the plan, and polls seemed to show that people liked it. And on election night, it got 41% of the vote. McCall was devastated, taking it as a personal rejection, and it nearly destroyed him. Very simply, Tom McCall misjudged the nature of the leadership required to bring voters to a considered judgment on something as fundamental as overhauling how we pay for public services. Which brings me to the main point. Leadership is not a set of heroic qualities found in a larger-than-life personality that we huddled masses admire from afar. Leadership, at least the aspect of leadership we have ignored, I believe, to our own peril, is a collective enterprise of interaction between leaders and followers that, in the process of addressing public wants and needs, transforms both leaders and citizens and leaves them better able to play their roles for the future. The heroic aspect of leadership, in my belief, has been overdone. When the Oregonian beats its drum, as it has done incessantly for the past year for leadership, it seems to have in mind the crusader, the solitary figure of resolute character and independent mind who brings the rest of us along by personality and persuasion. The problem with this is that it quickly becomes a cartoon version of what happens in the real world and what we need to happen. The pose of leadership suffices. The appearance of defending principle of taking action is good enough as long as the leader tried her best and faced squarely into the wind. But the pose of leadership becomes, in the extreme, cowardice. 
avoidance of responsibility, of real outcomes. We substitute for leadership the illusion of leadership, provide the right cues, the right theatrics, and hey, it's good enough. One scholar of leadership observed, much of what commonly passes as, as leadership, conspicuous position taking without followers or follow through, posturing on various public stages, manipulation without purpose, is no more leadership than the behavior of small boys marching in front of a parade. Now I want to contrast this heroic version, this Don Quixote version, this woman on a white horse version of leadership, <laughs> which prizes persuasion above all skills, and persuasion, as we know, easily degenerates into manipulation. I want to contrast that <coughs> with what I consider the most undervalued and almost invisible aspect of leadership. Leadership as teaching. Not in the simplistic sense of inculcating into an unruly class wisdom from on high, but consider what it is that great teachers do not simply lecture or drill facts into students. They engage students to the point that students hunger for information, for growth. They challenge students. They demand of students debate and second thought. And finally, they elevate students to a higher level of capacity for principled judgment. That is what I believe great leaders do. Ultimately, the work of leaders is to make better citizens. Uh, as a side note, I want to note that the progressives who crafted the Oregon Initiative and Referendum System 100 years ago, almost exactly, held out some the same hope. It wasn't simply a system to correct evils in the legislature. It was a device to help make better citizens. So, <coughs> The issue in Oregon today is not want of heroic leadership, it's want of followership. But don't blame the people. We are who we are and we're not about to transform ourselves from pretty speeches or more city club reports. But we can be lifted to a higher level of principled and considered judgment. We can be engaged to do better and harder work as citizens and followers and that is the work of leadership we need today. Thank you. Someone? Yes. Well, Dave, Dave, I think you should probably stay up at the podium. You, you wear it well, so. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is terrific. I think we've had, um, you know, three really uh, interesting perspectives on leadership. Uh, Gun telling us about leadership as doing you know, getting involved, it's kind of the action of leadership, very personal um, kind of notion. You know, Chris, when you were speaking, I was thinking about Star Wars, you know, let the force be with you, Luke, you know, and, and, and. Uh, that, that was my intent. That was it, okay, right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that works for me. And, and Dave, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking about how would Tom McCall have phrased this, you know, the languishing laziness of leadership, you know, <laughs> you go with the ravaging rampage of suburbia or whatever, but, uh, <laughs> but he would have done that somehow. Um, but in all these cases, I mean, I think the, the, the question that kept, keeps coming back to me is um, we do kind of hold leaders up as these kind of heroic sacrificial objects in some sense. And um, I guess the question is, uh, do you have to, do we have to have leaders to get things done? Because clearly we've gotten a lot done. Uh, in the last 30 years, but do we need, you know, what is it that l we need, a, you know, leaders for right now? I think we need leaders to get things done. If they have to, whether or not they have to be heroic is, is a really great question because I think if, um, um, I think some of the most effective leaders um, in all different sectors, you know, are really quiet um, people who are able to gather support for an idea. I think what we need and what I see succeeding and what I think we need in some of the su su sectors where we're not succeeding are A, somebody who's able to imagine a solution or an idea that we could get behind and B, who has the patience and teaching skills or whatever you want to call it to communicate that to a group of people that might then get behind them and help bring that idea about. And, and I, I think that when, in, in some of the sectors, one of the things I said to Dave about the whole school system issue in this uh, state, 
what I've heard is if we don't finance the schools, our schools are going to continue to stink. And they're going to fall apart. What I haven't heard articulated is if we finance the schools at an appropriate or, or, or more appropriate level, what might the outcome be that would benefit each of us as citizens? I haven't heard that articulated, that kind of idea or visioning. Um, and to me, that's well. Well, let me let me keep on that theme. You know, Dave, you mentioned that one of the things about leaders was we should maybe think of them as teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's this kind of learning that occurs. Um, okay. Well, another definition of a teacher is someone that helps you realize what you knew all the time, mm -hmm. right? So, um, in that sense, uh, you know, our leaders um, kind of doing this thinking for us, I think, as Chris is suggesting, or you know, what is it and how is it that leaders kind of extract from us what we already know? And you want to take a stab at that? What um, has struck me recently is that we have misunderstood or not appreciated the role that leaders play in creating enduring institutions which, in the words of somebody said, institutions are what lengthen the shadow of, of men. Uh, we have not paid much attention to this. I was thinking um, about the way that the political party arose as an institution in America, not because it was crafted in the Constitutional Convention. They actually didn't like the idea. But people found that without the political party, they had no way to connect between the people and the mechanisms of government in a fashion which achieved, arrived at and achieved a collective purpose. So the political party arose, whatever we think of it today, as the means by which we found and pursued a collective purpose. Since the creation of the political party, the main, ins the main institution added has been the initiative and referendum system. And it exists in very uneasy tension between our representative form of government uh, and the way the, the initiative operates. It seems to me that until we find a way to better engage students, our students, <laughs> citizens, in the work of being voters, uh, requiring of them and making it easier for them to do better deliberation, mm -hmm. uh, that we are not going to have the means of bringing any of what we want a teacher in a classroom to do to bear upon the work of citizenship. This doesn't entail, in my mind, recreating legally what the initiative is. It means doing the work that uh, Goon and Chris and hundreds of other people in the community do to begin to, to take all of this web of associations and, and places where we congregate uh, and bring them more to bear on the work of, of citizenship. So uh, that seems a little uh, long-winded and maybe pie in the sky, but it's just occurred to me that that's where we need to go. Um, Goon, go ahead. I met David Jaden for the first time about half a year ago. He came and spoke to Oregon Business Association about an idea that he had, and I think um, I, I, I was very excited when I heard it. He said, um, you know, talking to the fact that only about half of the people vote, and, and you know, only about 20% of people have kids in the public school systems, and or you know, then <coughs> not, maybe not recognizing what the, uh, how important a, public school, a good public school system is to the future of our state. Um, and what David was talking about it was a way to engage uh, Oregonians in a conversation about the schools, not as a way to, to cram information down their throat because we have enough of information, but um, opening up to a conversation. And, you know, this can be done in many different ways, but in groups like this or in groups like parent-teacher associations or whatever. But um, engage citizens and say, you know, what, what do you like about your schools? What, do you, what would you like to see different? 
and then at that point say, you know, this if that's the kind of school you want, this would cost so and so much. And at the time when people need the information, they would, would get it. And that really resonated with me because, you know, it's a, sort of a very practical way. He was talking about, however, of reaching half a million Oregonians, which is a lot of Oregonians. And I, being a practical person as, as I am, I thought that that's a lot of people to reach. <laughs> but <laughs> um, a lot of catalogs. A well. lot of catalogs. Well, <laughs> the thing is you can't do this with a catalog. You have to do it in, in forums where you actually meet people. And, and um, there's no way around it, I think. You can't just have it as an advertisement or whatever. But people really need to, in terms of the schools that we are all watching here with a great worry what will happen to that, we need to have a conversation like that. Okay, sounds good. Can I, I just one more repost on, on this quickly. Uh, another indictment of leadership. Uh, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where the answer is, well, we've just got to educate the public, yeah. which means beat them until they understand the facts of the matter. Uh, when I've seen great leaders at work, one of the skills they have is the art of listening and actually beginning to understand both the emotional and uh, cognitive ways in which people approach things, which is very different from those of us who pay a lot of attention to public affairs. And until we start from that end of things and treating as legitimate the way other people, ordinary citizens, think about the questions, the doubts, and so on they have, until we listen respectfully and attend to those, uh, I think leadership is going the wrong direction. Mm, right, trust and respect, which a lot of people Correct. noted as being critical. Well, Nikki Lynch, our board host, uh, jump on in here. Well, I, I want to take it back to kind of the more personal level, uh, just as a switch and, and to know a little more about you. Um, I think, you know, leadership is a special quality and, and you know, the creativity and, and the bravery and, you know, either the powers of persuasion or the powers to teach are, you know, important elements of that. And I guess my question is some of that I think we, people are just sort of born with certain qualities. But my question to each of you is, was there a person or an incident that happened in your life, probably early on, that gave you, that sparked you to realize that you could be a leader and, you know, that you could have success and that you could change things? Um, uh, well, I think I, I was bossing people around when I was about five. So um, <laughs> um, that, that part of it, you know, I think just came with the territory. I, I think maybe one observation I would make is, um, when I was running my company in Atlanta, I'd started it with nothing, and you know, a very mom and pop organization started in the basement of an old church with, you know, literally twenty-five hundred dollars. And about the sixth year in, we hired a managing director who actually had a, a degree in arts administration, and he wanted to do a strategic plan. And I resisted like heck. I said that sounds boring and too corporate, and you know. And uh, but he dragged me. You know, I really did it to appease him. And what I realized that. Uh, about that plan was that it allowed me to disengage a little bit from how acquainted I was with the obstacles in my way and to, to re-engage with the dream of what I actually wanted to accomplish. And we put it down in, you know, you know, steps and blah, 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 and five-year plan. And about a year and a half in, we had accomplished about 95% of what we'd written down. I was like, wow, this is great. Let's do some more. Um, it, that really simple visioning process, which did two things. One, it allowed me to engage with what was possible, but it also engaged the whole staff and board in that conversation. So at the same time that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeing something out there, my, what I'm seeing is also being formulated by the conversations I'm having with the stakeholders who are going to then, by the time we, we, we draft a document, they have such ownership of it that then th the logical action is for them to take is how do I help make this reality? So for me, that was a huge uh, piece of learning that I got dragged into. Um. I'm next. No, I almost forgot the question. But, oh. um, I'll, I'll have an answer anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> well, what made you a leader? <laughs> well, you know, I, I. Um, as I said, I'm a foreigner in this country, and, and maybe that saved me in some ways, because when we started the company, I felt like, you know, not only was I a foreigner, I was a new, newcomer to Portland, but I, I had to listen, and I had to ask people questions, because um, I didn't know very much. So um, 
and I guess I've, I've uh, you know, you always learn more, I think, by asking questions than by talking yourself. Three people. Um, Sam Lubell, who at the time I worked for him in the 60s and 70s, was a syndicated columnist based in New York who specialty was wandering around talking to voters on their doorsteps. I learned from that experience how to be respectful and how to listen to people carefully, and I learned that people may be ignorant in the sense of not knowing the facts, but they're not stupid. Um, they're, in fact, immensely capable of exercising sound judgment given the right tools and the right circumstances. Secondly, if you treat people with respect, uh, they do elevate themselves into a higher level of uh, engagement and, uh, I think, responsibility. Second person, Marco Haggard, professor at Portland State, who taught me the joy uh, and importance uh, of politics. And thirdly, Neil Goldschmidt, who uh, taught me that it's all possible. Thank you, Fred. Thanks. Um, did they answer your question? Yes. OK, good. Great. I'm sure there's more. OK, <laughs> terrific. You know, we've got a lot of interesting questions here from the audience. And um, a number of them deal with kind of the question of scale. You know, we, we do talk about leaders as kind of heroic figures about whom someday a book will be written, a street will be named, a plaque will be installed. Um, but part of what I hear you all saying is that leadership happens at lots of different scales. Um, that, in fact, uh, someone who may be a follower in one context, Dave, in fact, may be a leader in another. Um, how does that work? How do we kind of, you know, tap into essentially the leadership abilities that that people have in many different places and ways? I mean, you know, we're searching so much for the, you know, the big leader. Um, what's happening meanwhile, kind of with leadership in a more kind of intimate uh, scale? That was almost meant for me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> terrific. Yeah. Um, I'm involved in a group called Stand for Children, which is a grassroots group, the leading grassroots group uh, for children in America. And uh, Stand for Children just does just that. Um, you get, you know, you um, you get involved by saying, well, you know, I'm concerned about kids in my community, in my area, and then you uh, get together with other people who have the same concern, and together you decide what to work on. So. Um, and then you figure out how to get that done. And it could be working on a uh, dental program like the uh, Salem chapter did. Um, or it could be working on uh, higher wages for childcare workers, whatever the issues is. But uh, so then as, you, as the chapter then goes and, and um, figures out how to do this and gets it done, it's a tremendous leadership building process. Uh, so I've seen with my own eyes Stand for Children um, building hundreds of leaders in the community. Um, and so that's one way that I think really works. Professor okay. Dave? I think she did beautifully on that. OK, <laughs> terrific. Well, let me follow up on that a little bit then. Um, uh, we have probably 60 different leadership training programs in the metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. Um, at least. Um, and uh, experiences, as you described, Gwen, are in fact acquainting people with leadership and training them to be leaders. Um, you know, should we look to a day, uh, should we aspire uh, to a day when on the trucks that the city of Portland drives around, it's uh, Portland City of Leaders? You know, I mean, um, you know, we need followers, but, you know, would we be better off if everybody, uh, in some sense, um, understood themselves uh, as a leader in some context? No, because um, <laughs> then who would be following, I guess, is my question. I, I, don't know the, I don't know if this has anything to do with your question. I guess the thing that comes to my mind is, um, especially in the government sector in this state, you know, this, I don't know, this is probably not a good thing to say, but would anybody with real skills and with real talent spend their energies at the prime of their life trying to tackle a system that you can't see a way of fixing. I mean, that to me is, is one of the most, when I talk to, you know, people that I would say would, you know, God, you'd be a great mayor, you know, or man, you would be a great governor. You know, the skill sets are there, the intelligence is there, the vision is there, and I say, why don't you run? They're like, you know, you've got to be out of your mind. 
because, uh, you know, well, you guys know more about the becauses than I do, um, but, but I, I think one of the, quest the, the answers that I've heard over and over about, you know, where's our Tom McCall, where is our, our Neil Goldschmidt is, you could elect them today and they'd be working with a tax structure that was totally different than the, you know, the one that they were operating under 20 years ago. And would they have the same success, would they have the same opportunity for success that they had 20 years ago? Um, I, I don't know that we need more leadership um, programs. I think that there are leaders here. I think um, the way they, the, what they look like, how they succeed, are they going to be running Fortune 500 companies? Is this a community that is going to attract headquarters? And is that important to our success? Uh, th those are the questions that I would be focusing on. And how does the how does the tax system in this state and our ability to support the things that we think are important, how does that get addressed in a meaningful way so that the most skillful or most gifted people might have the opportunity or the desire to arise to that challenge? I, I have another thought about that. Um, whenever I hear someone say, oh, I wish someone would do something about that, I say, hold up the mirror. You know, whenever you hear yourself say that, you know, we can all do something. Dave? I don't think the issue is finding more leaders or having better leadership training. I want to come back to this notion of finding and experimenting with better institutions for improving the interaction between leaders and followers. Um, I think we need to do a lot more uh, along those lines. The internet is transforming politics in ways that we don't really realize. Most of them have not been particularly happy so far uh, in terms of the larger question of how, how can we operate to find common pur uh, purpose in, as citizens rather than simply sharpening the divides between us. Um, I do believe there are many things that we could be experimenting and attempting uh, to try to uh, better link or, or a stab, uh, better Im to improve the relationship and the interaction between leaders and followers along the lines I uh, promoted earlier. So uh, I'm not a fan of more leadership training per se. <laughs> okay. I think so, we've established that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave, is that, is that to say that you are a fan though of institutional reform in some way? Do we have institutions to match? kind of who we are and what we have to do. Yes, and I'm not suggesting this needs to be done in the sort of legal sense of let's go out and le uh, re uh, have a constitutional convention and redo the initiative system or anything like that. It has to do more with, uh, well, for example, watching how successful business operations and nonprofits operate and the lessons they've learned about collaborative leadership, shared leadership, and other things, and then finding ways to begin to inject those into the political process, again, much in the same way that the political party just came about because we found it necessary. Uh, so I think that uh, Goon and Chris probably have a lot to teach us if we take those lessons and find how to write them on the canvas of politics and public affairs. Okay, well, actually, and this feeds directly into another question we got from the audience, which is, okay, so, you know, what are the qualities of the leaders uh, that we need to get into public office now? Because, in fact, the reality is that, that those institutions are really important. So. Um, not only what are the qualities, but, you know, how do we attract those people in? You know, Chris, if people basically say, why the hell should I? Yeah. Um, that <laughs> leaves us with uh, dysfunctional institutions, in Dave's words. Yeah. Sorry, Dave, if those aren't your words, but close enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sound good to me. <laughs> that, that, um, that aren't going to change much. So, you know. So what do we do? How do we change that? Well, how do we get people into government? Uh, uh, that, in fact, aren't going to say, um, you know, my creativity ought to go towards something, something that else. I could right. actually be successful in. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, That's right, because it's important. Know, bottom line, <laughs> really, bottom line. Uh, I, I don't know. It's interesting as we're having this conversation. I'm Let thinking, the force be with you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Know, so. <laughs> he always is, Ethan. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I'm thinking th th this conversation is making me think about Christy Edmund again at, at PICA, um, because I think um, you know, Christy, she had an idea. She created her own mechanism for communicating that with anybody who she could 
grab hold of and make sit down and listen and teach about why uh, performance art and kind of really cutting edge um, ideas being brought into a community could stimulate the whole conversation that we we're a part of, uh, which in a sense she's, she created in a, in a much smaller way the mechanism that you're describing needs to be created for the major political ideas in this state if you want them to be um, innovated on, uh, changed. Now how do you get somebody with that kind of inventiveness and entrepreneurial kind of instinct uh, to take it on? I don't know. Honestly, I, I, I don't well, know. Well, let's, let's see if Gunnar or uh, Dave has an idea. How, you know, how do we get people into government who are going to listen well, um, teach uh, excellently? Um, you know, what do we do? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so I guess we don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go on to another question. <laughs> there was a um, there was an interesting notion that came up uh, in one of the, the questions here uh, that echoes something that Chris talked about. You know, this notion that you know you're moving towards your you know the opposite. Yeah. You know, well, I guess and that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And I guess part of it is you know you know do you agree? Um, but you know, we can set that aside for a moment. Take a look at the community that we're in. Um, we're about you know 50/50 urban and rural. We're about 50/50 conservative and liberal. Mm -hmm. Our um, major uh, leaders that we look to have succeeded primarily from the center. Um, you know, uh, so in many ways, um, kind of Oregon is a place that's kind of right in the middle. What is the opposite? You know, what what are we moving to? I mean, I think part of, I, I think part of the part of the part of the promise of Oregon is that we can imagine it moving almost in any direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully we move to the middle. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. I, I guess the thing, the, 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 the idea that comes to me, and it's the reason that I took the job at Portland Center Stage, because, um, you know, I, I um, resisted it with a lot of my um, intellect and my heart got hooked by, okay, this is a big mess that the board realizes has never worked. And if you could turn it around, there's a huge opportunity on the other side of that. And, and I think that that has kind of been what has played out. And I think recognizing that, okay, our educational system is in a huge crisis. Our state government's in a huge crisis. We're losing um, uh, corporate headquarters. Okay, if that's where we are in this cycle, then what opportunity does that present us? And what, what, what might be available to us just because we are in crisis and we are not status quo. Perhaps, um, perhaps the leader that we are uh, desiring could sniff that out and see, okay, if I got engaged at this particular moment, I might just have the opportunity to engage the citizenry in a way that has not been possible for the last 20 years. That's the, the, the mm -hmm. thought that. Well, and it sounds like, Dave, that's kind of what you have in mind, right? I think <coughs> there's a, uh, in fact, an in inevitability about political cycles because the history of politics is that those in the ascendancy overreach and expose themselves, and even if they don't, you just, people get tired of that act and want to see something else. So we, we do go through these cycles, and it will be inevitable. I think the test is that as the pendulum does begin to swing back, do those who think that, ah, now we can pass more tax measures for school, simply rest on their laurels and forget the larger issue, which is the disconnect between citizen, uh, citizens and their government? Okay. Hmm. You know, there's a couple questions here that deal with um, private sector leaders, with business leaders and corporate leaders. Um, and, you know, certainly one of the things that's been extremely important to Portland's history and Oregon's history has been a public-private partnership in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, when we think about uh, kind of where we need to have leadership, um, uh, what can we do with this legacy of public-private partnership and what kinds of things should we look to from corporate leaders? Um, are we looking for the right things? Well, I think the old model where we had uh, big headquarters and big amounts of money going to 
a uh, few charities in, in the city. That's, those days are gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you know, a lot of companies are connecting to the community in different ways. And I, I, um, you know, and I couldn't, it's just the feeling that I have. And, and I, you know, it, it is an opportunity for other people to step in when, when there is a vacuum. Um, I would observe that, uh, again, um, I think that we, we complain a lot that we've lost a lot of headquarters, and we have. And I've lived in cities that have gained headquarters, and I would rather live here. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think the notion that uh, those, the guys running those companies have the same levers to pull that they had 20 years ago is, is a mistaken notion. I think globalization has changed the process of decision making and it is no longer local anywhere. So we, we bemoan that change in this particular community, but at the same time I think there are, there's a level of leadership in the business community that is emerging that looks different than it did 20 years ago. And it is not going to be centralized, it is going to be smaller, um, smaller companies, a lot of smaller companies, but there is, um, I, I see great promise there. I, I just think it's going to look different than it did mm -hmm. uh, before. Dick? Well, we've had a tradition in this community of people who are not uh, the CEOs of major national corporations who have left an enormous imprint on the city, sometimes with some fanfare and some without. But I think of Bill Roberts, uh, Bill Nato, uh, and in uh, this audience, my friend John Russell, who have made contributions not known and not necessarily applauded in headlines, but uh, all I could say is whatever water they drink, I hope we're still doing it at Bull Run because uh, <laughs> they, they, are, they are the people who keep this the community we want to live in. And I, I honestly don't know where they come from or why. I think in part it is because there are places like the City Club and other where, where we do commune together, but I honestly Mm -hmm. Don't know. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it is, it's an interesting challenge for us all because from 1990 to 2000, the non-white population of the metropolitan area doubled. We're a different place than when Neil Goldschmidt was mayor. Um, we are a magnet for 25 to 34-year-olds. Um, Multnomah County attracted, uh, was the second fastest kind of magnet, for, growing magnet for 25 to 34-year-olds in the country during the decade of the 90s, second only to Las Vegas, which just grew so much that um, no one could come close. So there's kind of something going on. Um, and there are definitely new people coming into this community all the time uh, who are creating new institutions, um, you know, who are already looking at the Portland Institute of Contemporary Art as, you know, kind of an old institution. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things going on uh, that really raise, I think, challenges for um, what we uh, consider to be the task for leaders as well as who those leaders actually are. Um, we're kind of getting close to the end here. Is there any kind of last comment that any of our panelists would like to make? No last comment. Uh, well, I, Chris. I, I, yeah, I would just say, um, um, I, I, you know, I feel incredibly encouraged by the, the direction that this community is taking, and I know that's not a popular opinion. Um, I, I do think that we are not going to look like Atlanta or Denver or Phoenix or. Um, you know, and um, you know, and, and I do, I do think that is something to applaud and be grateful for, um, and and to figure out what are the things we can do um, smarter and and more successfully. But to acknowledge that our direction, our forward motion, is going to be unique, as unique as it has been in the past. I think that's something to celebrate. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, I'd also say, uh, Gun, you said something I think which is really profound, which is if you're looking for a leader, um, look in the mirror. Um, if you're looking for someone to get something done because it needs to be done, look in the mirror. Um, and I hope uh, what we've at least inspired a couple people out there to do today is to get out and, and uh, get things done. So thanks to our panelists. Great. Thank you. Oh, oh. Yeah, I'm not. So you